You've probably heard about the mysterious sea state of Atlantis. It was a high-tech utopia where people lived happily, but then something happened, and Atlantis disappeared from the face of the Earth. Many people believe that this city lies at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. But what if we've been looking in the wrong place all this time? What if it's somewhere different from where they're trying to find it? What if all this time Atlantis was in the middle of the Sahara Desert? Well, this unexpected theory has some evidence. But to study this version, you first need to understand what Atlantis was and how we got to know about it. The very first mention of the mysterious city was in 360 BCE. Ancient philosopher Plato wrote about Atlantis. His work, Dialogues, described Atlantis as a rich land with advanced technologies. Its inhabitants were powerful, intelligent, and beautiful, like superhumans. He described in detail the structure of the city, and this was the main reason why many people believed in the existence of Atlantis. According to his records, the Atlanteans built this place in several concentric circles of black and red stone. Then they covered these circles with brass, tin, and precious metals. In the city, there were water channels on which ships sailed. The Atlanteans were sailors, so they built a passage from their city to the open sea. On the internet, you can find many drawings of Atlantis, created based on Plato's descriptions. Take a look at these drawings and an actual photo of the Eye of the Sahara. This place in the Sahara has a shape of several concentric circles. It looks as if a destroyed city left a trace on the sand. Many people have written online that the lost city was located there, but no one could prove it. Once upon a time, the Sahara was filled with rivers and lakes. In prehistoric times, there was only water there. So far, everything matches. The Eye of the Sahara was first discovered in the 1930s. This place was considered a crater from a fallen meteorite. But in the middle of the 20th century, scientists conducted a soil analysis and refuted the version with a fallen space rock. In the end, everyone agreed that this was a dome of molten rocks under which magma was raging. For millions of years, wind and water had been destroying the formed landscape and eventually made it look like perfect circles. But what if the Atlanteans once came to this place and used natural circles to build a city? In this case, we would have many traces and artifacts from this developed civilization. And yes, archaeologists did find some arrowheads, spears, oars, and other things there. But this has nothing to do with Atlantis. In the Eye of the Sahara, a multitude of Ashulian artifacts lies. It was an ancient tribe that frequented this place. For the first time, Ashulian tools appeared more than one and a half million years ago. Some of the items found there may be 130,000 years old. And according to the records, Atlantis existed about 12,000 years ago. Archaeologists found no artificial structures in this place. There was also no debris or traces of a large city. People would have found some stuff if a big city with advanced technologies had existed here. The main supporter of this idea was one YouTube channel. It collected a million views and attracted the attention of many historians and anthropologists. The theory that the Eye of the Sahara is Atlantis was quickly refuted. People found too many discrepancies between this place and the description of Atlantis. The author tried to catch the viewer's attention by presenting external similarities between the natural landscape and the fictional ancient city. Another popular theory claims that Atlantis was a real continent located off the Bahamas. But then, this city was swallowed up by the Bermuda Triangle. According to this legend, the city ruins still lie at the bottom of the triangle, but there's no confirmation of this theory either. Writer Charles Berlitz invented it. Adherents of this theory claim that the walls and streets in the western part of the Bahamas might be the ruins of Atlantis. But scientists disagree. They have proven that these walls are natural formations of coastal rocks. There are also rumors that the story of Atlantis was inspired by an actual historical catastrophe, the Black Sea Flood. This is the Bosporus, a strait in Turkey connecting the Black Sea and the Sea of Marmara. 
Around 5600 BCE, the Black Sea was twice as small as it is now and had many cities on its shores. Unfortunately, a huge flood destroyed this flourishing civilization. Within a year, cities descended underwater, and surviving inhabitants moved to foreign lands and spread stories about the flood. Maybe these stories inspired Plato to come up with Atlantis. In the 1950s, people came up with another version. Atlantis was the continent that is now Antarctica. Tens of thousands of years ago, a warm continent with a developed city shifted to the northern part of our planet because of the movement of Earth's crust. The Atlanteans couldn't adapt to the cold conditions and Atlantis was covered with a thick layer of ice. This theory was refuted when scientists began studying the tectonic plate's nature. It turned out that Earth's crust couldn't have moved such a huge continent as Antarctica. The tectonic plates don't behave this way at all. But the main question is, was Atlantis real? No one had described it before Plato. Perhaps the philosopher came up with it. Maybe he did this to emphasize the correctness of his views on life and to identify his philosophical theories. In his works, he wrote a lot about divine and human nature and how people can destroy this nature. He spoke of decaying ideal societies because of immoral behavior and vices. The Atlanteans were once moral, spiritual people who created a utopia, but then they became greedy and mean. They destroyed their inner nature, and for this, they had to witness the destruction of their city. One night, fires and earthquakes hit Atlantis and plunged the city into the sea. The higher powers punished people for their immoral behavior, and Plato also wanted everyone to be afraid of moral decay. But, judging by the descriptions of the earthquakes and fire, it may seem that Atlantis was destroyed by a volcanic eruption, as it was with the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. And such destructions have happened pretty often throughout history. Natural disasters ruined many developed cities. One of the most famous cases occurred in 1100 BCE in the Mediterranean Sea, when a volcanic eruption destroyed the highly developed Minoan society. The Minoan society existed for about 2,000 years. These people mostly lived on the islands of Crete and Santorini, located north of Crete. The Minoans had beautiful houses, a sewage system, and a developed economy. They were engaged in agriculture, grew fruits and vegetables, painted frescoes, and made jewelry. They were the first people to found the Thalassocracy, an empire based on the sea. They lived off of fishing, piracy, and maritime trade. At the time, they performed cruel rituals, and their way of life was far from moral. They were used to earthquakes on the island of Santorini, so they reinforced the walls of the city with wooden beams, but they didn't know what a volcanic eruption was. And when the sulfur smell appeared in the air, they didn't suspect the impending catastrophe. When the volcano spilled out tons of lava and ash, all the residents of Santorini abandoned their homes and tried to escape, but they couldn't. The eruption and earthquake triggered a tsunami. A large wave flooded the coastal part of the island of Crete. This hit the economy of the Minoans hard and destroyed their port harbor. Then, foreigners attacked Crete and finally destroyed the developed civilization. Some historians think that Plato could have referred to the Minoan Empire when describing Atlantis. Using their example, he showed how immoral actions could destroy people. Imagine that it's the year 2025, and our planet has completely changed. Rising sea levels, extreme weather, and the ocean becoming more and more acidic are just some of the problems people have been dealing with for years. But in one of the world's largest coastal cities, the situation has become too serious. It was a sunny day in June when a massive earthquake shook the city to its core. The ground beneath people's feet heaved and shook, and buildings swayed dangerously. People ran through the streets in panic, trying to find safety. But as soon as the ground settled, the inhabitants of the city realized the real danger. A wall of water, almost 100 feet high, was rushing toward the city, propelled by the force of the earthquake. The tsunami hit the city with unimaginable force. Entire neighborhoods were wiped out, and thousands of people lost their lives. But here's where things get interesting. In the aftermath of the disaster, 
the city's authorities realized that they couldn't just rebuild the city as it was before. They needed to be better prepared for the next potential disaster. And so they came up with an incredibly ambitious project to build an underwater city. The goal was to create a self-sufficient, sustainable city beneath the ocean's surface that could withstand any natural disaster. The underwater city would be powered by renewable energy, using tidal power and underwater solar panels. It would be designed to withstand extreme weather and would have its own emergency response systems. The project attracted some of the world's top scientists, engineers, and architects. They worked tirelessly to design the city and carefully considered every aspect of the project. The underwater city would have everything that a typical city had, from schools and hospitals to stores and restaurants. There would be underwater farms where fish and other marine creatures could grow. The city would even have its transportation system, advanced submarines and underwater tunnels connecting different parts of the city. The project became a shining beacon of hope for people. It showed that even in the face of disaster, we could come together to create something amazing. But as time went on, the project no longer seemed so perfect. The cost of the project turned out to be higher than planned. There were also concerns about how long such a project would exist. After all, the ocean is very unpredictable. And still, the team of scientists and engineers never gave up. After years of trial and error, they finally created the perfect underwater city. A marvel of engineering. A self-contained ecosystem that could sustain people indefinitely. The buildings were constructed from a material that could withstand the immense pressure at the bottom of the ocean. And the city itself was powered by a network of advanced hydroelectric turbines. It wasn't long before the first wave of colonists arrived at the underwater city. There were different people in this group, and each of them had their own reasons for choosing to live in this new world beneath the waves. Some were adventurers seeking a new world to explore, while others were hoping to escape natural disasters raging on dry land. But despite their differences, all these people shared a common goal, to build a new society one that was in harmony with the natural world. The underwater city flourished and new discoveries were made every day. The colonists developed new technologies and ways to tame the power of the ocean. They learned to farm the sea and started cultivating underwater gardens that provided them with a steady food supply. But living underwater was challenging. People felt isolated and even claustrophobic. The situation came to a head when a group of activists started to protest against the city's expansion plans. They argued that the underwater city was a threat to the environment it was meant to protect and that the colonists should focus on reducing their impact on the delicate underwater life. The protests sparked a heated debate among the colonists. Some of them argued that the survival of the city depended on its growth and expansion. Others claimed that the city needed to prioritize the protection of the environment above all else. In the end, a compromise was reached. The city would continue to expand, but the main priority would be sustainability and a responsible attitude to nature. The colonists would do their best to reduce their impact on the environment by using new technologies and following strict conservation rules. And they would also remember the importance of protecting the ocean and its fragile ecosystem. Years went by, and the underwater city continued to thrive. New generations of colonists were born, and they grew up in a world entirely different from the one their ancestors had known. They never saw the world on the surface, but appreciated the beauty and complexity of the underwater world they called home. And as the years passed, the city became a symbol of hope for a world struggling with the devastating effects of climate change. It showed that despite all difficulties, people could come together to create a better world. It is a reminder that the future is not set in stone and that we can build it sustainably and in harmony with the natural world. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. 
This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades, and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt, where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria, with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched, and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books. But what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country, and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Odd. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him. But Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, 
she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. Question for you. Do you think Atlantis could be real? It remains as one of history's greatest mysteries. The legend began with Plato all the way back in ancient Greece. The tale of a civilization that formed and prospered before our own. Atlantis was supposedly a highly technological society, much like the Mayans. But, as the legend says, due to the people's greed, they were punished by a flood that destroyed and submerged their cities. Different theories try to guess Atlantis' location. Some say it was in the Mediterranean Sea. Some say it's beneath the Bermuda Triangle. But, as science has shown us, Atlantis may be only an allegory for humankind. Today, you'll discover several amazing underwater cities that you have never heard of. They existed indeed and are not just a myth. We're taking you on an excursion to the underwater city of Baia, which is on the coast of Italy. Known as the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire, Baia was a resort city. The Roman elite traveled there for recreation. Imagine an open-air spa. That was Baia. You can visit the submerged town by scuba diving and get close to that perfectly preserved, magnificent Roman sculpture. A true underwater wonder. You can spot the crumbled temples and buildings through glass-bottom boats. This is a moss-covered museum in Claudio's Nymphium. To your left, you can see a collection of classical Greek statues. Swimming down the Via Herculiana, you'll arrive at Villa Aprotio. Villas are Italian-style houses, and here, you can admire their original marble floors. Notice the black and white patterns and the astounding shapes they make. Next, you'll arrive at Portus Julius. 
Can you see the collapsing wall structures at the bottom of the seafloor? You'll see well-preserved columns and limestone floors. Behold the ruins of the thermal baths of Lacus. The remaining multicolored mosaics are something great to see. You'll see their orange, blue, and green tiles if you get close enough. At Pisoni's Villa Pila, you'll see 25 preserved Roman pillars. Notice the arches, the frescoes nearby, and the magnitude of this well-kept treasure. The city was located over natural volcanic vents, so there were hot springs to be used at will. People went there looking to have an excellent time. And when I say people, I mean some of the great Roman emperors we learn about in school. Nero, Cicero, Caesar. But around the 8th century, the city was sacked and the luxurious town was abandoned. Slowly, the water level rose and the city started to drown. You are on a summer vacation off the coast of Greece, four hours outside of Athens in the Peloponnese Peninsula on Pavlo Petri. You dust off your snorkel and head for a free dive on a bright sunny day. Some time into the dive, you start noticing patterns on the seabed. 13 feet below the surface, the outline of familiar objects starts to appear one by one. As you continue swimming, what looks like the outline of an entire city emerges before your eyes. You wonder how could water have taken the whole city? Rocks are perfectly aligned into what appears to be the foundation of a building. Nicholas Fleming, a British oceanographer on vacation in Greece, was the person that discovered Pavlo Petri. He was documenting the seafloor artifacts. The team found the site filled with pots, storage vessels, and tools. A quern stone, for instance, is a tool used for grinding grains and turning them into flour. Multiple amphoras, which were found then, indicate that this settlement dated back to the Bronze Age, 5,500 years ago, when people started living in towns. The settlement is believed to have lasted for over 2,400 years. Pablo Petri is considered today the oldest submerged town yet found. And it's impressive that it wasn't a simple village. It was a vibrant port city with stone-built buildings, a marketplace, streets, and even squares. Let's continue our exploration and find secrets in other underwater cities. You are diving off the coast of the Ryukyu Islands. Pacific waters are far from smooth. There's a strong current pulling you into the deep sea. Suddenly, you see a huge structure thanks to the sunlight shining down on the seabed. At first, it looks like Machu Picchu's ruins across the globe in Peru. As you approach it, you slowly figure out its form. A pyramid-shaped structure, arches, staircases. It's something that could have easily been a palace or castle. Could this also be a sign of human activity? What you just saw is known today as the Yanaguni Monument. It also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis. The entire monument is about the size of five football fields and the height of a five-story building. Its most surprising feature is its expansive terraces that host large crowd gatherings. Explorers and scientists believe that Yanaguni dates back to 10,000 years ago. But whether it is a man-made structure or a natural formation is still under debate. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Masaki Kimura, Yanaguni is the heritage of a lost civilization. Kimura has dived into exploring the ruins over 100 times over the past 10 years. According to him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. The Triangle Pool, located on the monument's surface, is a triangle-shaped concave that is a historical symbol of water fountains in the region. There is also a giant turtle carved on the eastern side of the structure. And according to Kimura, turtles have an important cultural meaning. Several pieces of stone tools have been recovered from the site. Their estimated age dates back to 10,000 years ago. However, not all scientists are convinced of the same. For many, Yanaguni is the result of thousands of years of erosion. The fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe that it is not human-made. The defined edges and flat surfaces resemble a natural formation occurrence in Northern Ireland, known as Giant's Causeway. A series of interlocking basalt columns look like the ruins of a palace, but they were the result of volcanic activity in the region. Well, stay tuned for more underwater discoveries! The next stop in our voyage is one of today's most famous underwater cities that has turned into an underwater archaeological park. The city of Port Royal in Jamaica exists today only below the surface. But in 1692, 
it was one of the wealthiest cities in the Western Hemisphere. Port Royal was the center of the British Empire at the time, and an important trade city that attracted people from all over. It was also home to real-life pirates of the Caribbean. On the morning of June 7, 1692, the people of Port Royal met a different fate than they probably expected. The bars and restaurants beaming with life woke up shaking. People were taken out of bed with the power of a massive earthquake, estimated today at 7.5 on the Richter scale. One survivor says he saw the earth opening up and swallowing the town whole. What he said could be true, as the city was mainly built over sand. The ground sucked buildings, roads, and everyone above. Geysers erupted, and finally, waves as big as 10-story high buildings hit the city. About 33 acres of the city disappeared underwater, and amazingly, most of its 17th century remains lie in good condition under 40 feet of water. In the ruins, archaeologists have found taverns, storage rooms, kitchens, and recreational buildings used for diverse purposes. You can see a grand lion statue, a submerged bridge, and many picturesque arches. Now, do you fancy a trip to India? Just outside its coast lies another sunken marvel. A site known as the Lost City of Cambay is located on the gulf of a similar name. It remained hidden until 2001, when the National Institute of Ocean Technology did a routine water assessment. With sonar technology, which sends a wave of sound to the bottom of the sea, they found something far beneath the surface. Images showed well-defined geometric shapes spread along a 5-mile stretch. The remains found dated to more than 9,500 years ago, meaning that this civilization was lost at around the end of the Ice Age. Debris recovered from the site included construction material, pottery, beads, sculptures, and even bones. Scientists argue whether these artifacts are indeed from the site. But if they truly are, then the lost city of Cambay would be the oldest civilization in the world. In 1945, five TBF Avenger aircraft took flight for a routine training exercise around the Bermuda Triangle. In the middle of the exercise, the planes were struck by intense rain and heavy winds, despite the clear weather forecast. The pilots became extremely disoriented and radioed the base to report that their navigational equipment had stopped working. The last thing the base heard was, when the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we all go down together. And then, static. The five planes and their 14 passengers were never seen or heard from again. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night, when he was on the deck of the ship, he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. He might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. In March 1918, carrying a crew of 306 people, the USS Cyclops left Barbados and headed home to Baltimore. The ship passed through the Bermuda Triangle on its journey and was never seen again. The Cyclops never issued any distress signal and disappeared without any explanation, making it the largest ship to go missing in the Bermuda Triangle. No wreckage has ever been found. No one exactly knows how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. In the year 1800, a large sailing vessel called the USS Pickering departed from the US on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew and was never heard from again. The USS Pickering was the first ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle. It's believed that the ship was taken out by a storm, but because no wreckage was ever found, we'll never know for sure. William Shakespeare's famous play, The Tempest, was inspired by the Bermuda Triangle. Sailors returned home to England to tell stories of treacherous waters near the Bahamas where ships mysteriously disappeared. These stories made it back to the bard himself, 
and inspired his final play about a storm at sea transporting a ship to a mysterious land. The shipwreck in Shakespeare's play is based on the 17th century ship Sea Venture. The ship was carrying supplies from England to Virginia when it was struck by a massive storm in the Bermuda Triangle. Sea Venture was battered by the storm for three days and barely made it to the shore. Survivors of the wreck were stranded on a desolate stretch of Bermuda for nine months. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. No trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. A huge investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. Because the Bermuda Triangle isn't a recognized place, no one knows its exact location or size. Some people believe it covers around 500,000 square miles around the Bermuda area. Other people believe the triangle is as big as 1.5 million square miles. The Bermuda Triangle is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the Bermuda Triangle mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. The Bermuda Triangle is home to the deepest point in the Atlantic Ocean, the Milwaukee Deep. The area has a maximum depth of over 27,000 feet. This is one of the deepest points in the ocean floor, but still not close to the massive 35,000 feet of the Mariana Trench. But the huge depth might explain how such little wreckage has been found. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. In the year 1800 again, the ship USS Insurgent was on patrol when it stopped briefly at a coastal base before heading back out to sea. That was the last time USS Insurgent was ever seen. A severe storm reportedly struck the West Indies around that time. It's believed that storm was so powerful, it could have caused the sinking of both the USS Insurgent and USS Pickering, which vanished around the same time. Like the Pickering, no wreckage of the Insurgent was ever discovered. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves that reach up to 100 feet tall. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. Joshua Slocum was an extremely talented sailor. He was the first person to ever sail single-handedly around the world. But sadly, he was no match for the Bermuda Triangle. In November 1909, Slocum said goodbye to his wife and set off on one of his usual winter voyages to the West Indies. Slocum's wife reported him missing after several months passed without any contact. It's said that he called in at Miami to resupply before vanishing into the Bermuda Triangle. Just off the coast of Japan, you'll find the Bermuda Triangle of the Pacific Ocean. They call it the Dragon's Triangle. Between 1950 and 1954, nine ships disappeared in this area without leaving a trace. The ship Kayo Maru 5 was sent to investigate these unexplained disappearances when it also vanished. After this incident, the Japanese authorities labeled the area as a danger zone and sailors are encouraged to avoid it. On the ocean floor, decomposing organisms let off large concentrations of methane gas that gets trapped under the water. This gas can build up until, boom, it ruptures. The gas surges up to the surface and erupts. If a ship was in the area of one of these ruptures, 
the water would become much less dense and cause the ship to sink rapidly and without warning. Scientists believe this could be the cause of the many disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. While this theory makes a lot of sense, it doesn't seem too likely. The United States Geological Survey has stated that no large releases of gas are believed to have occurred in the Bermuda Triangle for the past 15,000 years. In July 2015, two teenagers disappeared after setting sail off the coast of Florida. There's some mystery about what the two teens were really getting up to. They told their parents that they were just going to fish, but they told their friends that they were crossing to the Bahamas. Shortly after they left, a line of thunderstorms moved towards the area and the boys were never heard from again. A massive 15,000 mile search was conducted, but sadly, nothing was found. One year later, the pair's boat was found off the coast of Bermuda with a broken iPhone and some personal effects left inside. One of the most popular and bizarre theories trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charles Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Muvel Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the Giant Crystal Cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the southern Atlantic Ocean. 
A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super-tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build-a-circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now, who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Ruzo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. The thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. In 2018, the most powerful underwater earthquake occurred between East Africa and Madagascar. There was a deep rift between the Earth's crust and the mantle. 
hundreds of thousands of tons of magma came out on the surface of the ocean floor. After that, a huge underwater volcano with a height of 2,700 feet was formed near the coast of Madagascar. This is almost twice the height of the Empire State Building. And all this is hidden under the water. French scientists studied this place since it had regular seismic activity. When the geologists went on an expedition to the coast of Madagascar, they discovered this giant underwater rock, which was not here until recently. With the help of geological equipment, they discovered the earthquake happened deeper than usual, below the Earth's crust. Geologists created a special observatory to monitor the situation at this site in real time. Between February and May 2019, they recorded about 17,000 seismic activities below the ocean floor. Scientists had never recorded such deep earthquakes. This suggests that there are reservoirs and drainage systems inside our planet through which magma flows. It's like the veins and vessels of a living organism. The volume of lava the volcano spews at this place can be compared with the volcanic eruptions in the hottest spots of Earth. Perhaps this is one of the most catastrophic, but at the same time, beautiful events in nature over the past few years. To understand what can be beautiful about this, let's first figure out what an underwater volcano is and how it works. Inside our planet, there are incandescent liquid metals and molten rocks containing almost all the chemical elements from the periodic table. All this hot substance is called magma, which constantly flows in the planet's bowels. Anyway, magma is lighter than the surrounding Earth's crust, so it always tries to break out upwards. Fortunately, the surface of our planet is strong enough and doesn't allow magma to splash out. But sometimes it happens, and here's why. The Earth's crust consists of many solid parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other because of movement. Imagine a massive picture of puzzles. Each detail of this puzzle is a tectonic plate, and they all are constantly moving. Sometimes one puzzle gets unhooked from another. When this happens, magma immediately spills out of the resulting gap. And these places of fault with flowing magma we call volcanoes. When such a volcano erupts, a new geology begins. A splash of magma shakes the ocean floor. Lava and ash erupt from the inside of our planet. It causes a release of destructive energy of incredible power. But thanks to the water, such a catastrophe can go unnoticed. More than 70% of the seismic activity associated with volcanoes occurs underwater, and almost no one notices it. But inside the water, there's a total mess. Lava heats the water and destroys the seabed. The ocean in this area boils, and large air bubbles rise up. But the enormous pressure of hundreds of millions of gallons of water suppresses the volcano's destructive power. Molten rocks of the Earth's crust are pressed against the seabed. The ocean blocks the consequences of the disaster. But sometimes, the eruption gets to the surface. Such a case occurred in 2012. Vast pieces of pumice the size of a van began to float up in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. There were hundreds, even thousands of them. It was more like a group of unknown islands. Volcanic rocks scattered in the ocean over an area twice as large as New Zealand. Scientists used deep-sea sonar apparatus on the remote control to determine the full scale of the disaster. They studied the seabed for a long time and found 14 craters that released lava. The researchers saw that more than a third of the erupted volcanic material surfaced and scattered throughout the ocean. The rest was scattered along the bottom. It destroyed all marine life in the area. However, after the eruption of volcanoes, life is reborn like a phoenix from the ashes. Volcanic ash, lava, and soil around the volcano contain many useful elements and minerals. They nourish the soil and promote the development of microorganisms not only on land but also in water. That's why there's so much vegetation, flowers, and trees around volcanoes. And underwater volcanoes can eventually form natural islands. This is a long process, resulting from which a large piece of land comes out of the water. When magma goes out, the water immediately presses it to the seabed. 
the eruption can go on for a long time. The released magma raises the level of the seabed. After another hundred, maybe a thousand years, a new eruption begins. New magma flows lay a new layer on the surface of the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, the volcano has been growing. It's slowly rising up because of constant eruptions. Some volcanoes may go out forever, and some continue to erupt. And then, one day, the level of volcanic rock reaches the surface in the form of a huge island. After many more years, the volcano may go out, and then life appears on the formed island. The destroyed seabed area is filled with animals, trees, flowers, and plants. These volcanic islands have unique ecosystems because they develop separately from all continents. Observing such islands helps scientists understand how life on Earth was born. There are hundreds of islands around the world that have appeared because of eruptions of underwater volcanoes. You can find them in Hawaii, Indonesia, and Iceland. Many of them are inhabited by people. They build villages and small towns there. The ground on such islands is fertile. Fruits and vegetables grow there. The water is filled with fish. Such places may seem like paradise, but at the same time, it's dangerous to live there because the volcano may wake up. One of the most famous eruptions occurred on the island of Ogashima, south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful city right in the crater of an active volcano. And in May 1785, the eruption began. No one expected this to happen. At some point, thousands of birds rose and flew away from the island. And then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from beneath the underground depths. Thick smoke escaped from the top of the green volcano. The mountain threw dirt, large rocks, and red-hot pieces of magma into the sky. The disaster lasted several weeks. People managed to evacuate. And then there was a long recovery. Locals rebuilt the houses and brought the city back. Almost 250 years have passed since that moment. And during this time, the volcano has never woken up. Despite the risk of a new eruption, people continue to live there. The population is growing since this place resembles paradise, and no one wants to leave it. There are thermal springs, dense jungles with rich soil, and many fish. Meteorological and seismological services constantly monitor the volcano's activity. Movements and fractures of tectonic plates create another natural disaster, destructive tsunamis. Unlike volcanoes, huge waves are formed when seismic activity causes the crust to move vertically, up or down. When this happens, water pressure shifts on the ocean floor, which releases energy. This energy pushes the water and creates a tsunami. By the same principle, you form a small wave when you throw a stone into the water. First, a small tsunami appears. Then it picks up speed and increases in size. Its height can reach the level of a five-story building. It's heading for the coast and accelerating to 500 miles per hour. This is almost twice as fast as a Formula One race car. Millions of gallons of water, weighing thousands of tons, are getting closer. And now, the wave reaches the shore and demolishes everything in its path. Houses, trees, cars, nothing can withstand the destructive force of nature. Such tsunamis are a frequent occurrence on the coast of Japan. People have built massive shields near the land to stop the waves before they hit the shore. Still, in spite of all preparedness, somehow, nature always prevails. The Bermuda Triangle is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the Bermuda Triangle mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night, when he was on the deck of the ship, he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. You might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. 
This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. No one exactly knows how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. No trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. A huge investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for the many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves that reach up to 100 feet tall. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. Just off the coast of Japan, you'll find the Bermuda Triangle of the Pacific Ocean. They call it the Devil's Triangle. Between 1950 and 1954, nine ships disappeared in this area without leaving a trace. The ship Kayo Maroon 5 was sent to investigate these unexplained disappearances when it also vanished. After this incident, the Japanese authorities labeled the area as a danger zone, and sailors were encouraged to avoid it. Some people blame all disasters on the extraterrestrial paranormal activity. Others suppose it's all about raging natural phenomena. Some scientists believe the cause of anomalies is the environmental changes. Also, there's a really high concentration of methane hydrates on the bottom of the ocean in the Pacific Bermuda area. This gas tends to set off, and when it happens, bubbles start forming on the surface of the water. These gas eruptions can interrupt the ability to float and can easily sink a ship. Because of this chemical reaction, there won't be even a trace left. Underwater volcanoes are said to be another possible explanation for the Japanese Dragon's Triangle. In fact, they can take down even small islands. Luckily, nobody lives there. It's a pretty common thing in this area that some of them disappear underwater and others appear out of the blue because of seismic activity. You'll never find the Dragon's Triangle on any official map of the world, so nobody's quite sure about how large it is in reality. In July 2015, two teenagers disappeared after setting sail off the coast of Florida. There's some mystery about what the two teens were really getting up to. They told their parents that they were just going to fish, but they told their friends that they were crossing to the Bahamas. Shortly after they left, a line of thunderstorms moved towards the area, and the boys were never heard from again. A massive search was conducted, but sadly, nothing was found. One year later, the pair's boat was found off the coast of Bermuda with a broken iPhone and some personal effects left inside. One of the most popular and bizarre theories trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charles Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. Previously, the compass wouldn't work well in the Bermuda Triangle since the lines of the two poles coincided here – true north and magnetic north. But if you fall into this line, your compass will behave strangely. But the magnetic north is constantly shifting, and now it's far beyond the triangle. No legend says pirates of the last centuries operate in the Bermuda Triangle, or that the Flying Dutchman makes other ships disappear. A popular theory is that ships travel to the distant past or future through a time portal in the Bermuda Triangle. Fortunately, these are all myths. 
Just imagine hundreds of giant tentacles reaching out to a group of ships sailing through the Bermuda Triangle. In the past centuries, they could easily sink an entire fleet, since the ships were made of wood and were lighter. Squids wrapped decks with their strong tentacles, made holes in the ship's hulls with their sharp beaks. Toothy suction cups could break the masts and tear the sails. The water was filling the holds and slowly rising to the deck. The ship sank in a matter of minutes. Survivors reached the shore and told everyone about huge monsters. This is how the legends of the Kraken appeared. Fortunately, now people have sonars and equipment for monitoring the sea space. They say the main reason why this place is so enigmatic must be the magnetic fields that form this ominous triangle. Ocean floor is made of rocks containing a lot of magnetite. It's more like iron. Magnetic fields react to the high concentration of magnetite on the ocean floor, which may start a sort of conflict between the two. It can often lead to various weather anomalies and, as a result, navigation issues. And naturally, any changes in the ocean floor or the Earth's magnetic fields influence the Bermuda Triangle a lot. Magnetic fields tend to shift their position, so do tectonic plates and even the continents, even though we never notice it. The skies are usually very clear there, but back in 1883, some people witnessed abnormal things in the area. Some claim to have seen large blocks of ice falling from the skies, and the crew even managed to save one as hard proof. Seems like the Bermuda Triangle has an alternate not only on Earth, but even in space. Spacecraft usually don't disappear into thin air, though, like there's no air. This anomalous area is really large and stretches right above the South Atlantic. It occupies the area from Chile to Zimbabwe and sits right at the point where Van Allen radiation belts are the closest to the surface of our planet. The Earth has two such belts, which come in handy trapping the particles that shoot in from the Sun. They do a great job protecting the Earth from radiation. The magnetic field there is lower, so it allows the Earth's radiation belt to come closer to the surface. Whenever a satellite passes by, it will be exposed to radiation, which might lead to serious damage. So no satellite can take pictures of it. The South Atlantic anomaly is part of the Earth where natural radiation just flows out of control. Still, there is little evidence that all these triangles are really dangerous. Many believe the Bermuda Triangle itself has been proven time and again to be nothing but a work of fiction. In fact, some shipwrecks, such as the Ellen Austin, gained popularity in the middle of the 20th century, while nobody even thought of drawing a triangle in the Bermuda area before that. The mystery was popularized by science fiction writers and became a common myth, while no serious research proved it any more dangerous than other parts of the world's ocean. So the crew of the Ellen Austin back in 1881 weren't even aware of the Bermuda Triangle back then, let alone afraid of it. What do you think? As an experienced sailor and the first man to ever sail non-stop on his own around North and South America, Matt Rutherford has seen a lot during his voyages. But what he saw in 2013 while sailing through the waters of the Atlantic with his colleague surely stands out some 800 miles off the coast of Bermuda, not far away from the famous Bermuda Triangle, they noticed a boat that seemed to be moving by itself. The sails weren't up and the motor wasn't running. The sailors decided to check if there was someone who needed their help aboard, so they moved closer to the mysterious ship. Once they got there, things only got weirder as they realized there wasn't a living soul aboard. Rutherford started filming to document their discovery. The boat looked so awfully abandoned that they expected to find some pretty scary things in there. But it didn't stop Rutherford from searching the vessel. The boat, which turned out to be named Wolfhound, looked like an upscale one, probably costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was pretty weird to find it floating by itself in the middle of the ocean. It seemed like whoever abandoned it was leaving in a rush. There were clothes and other personal belongings all over the main cabin. Some parts of the ceiling had fallen and some drawers had popped open. The brave sailors decided to tow the ghost ship back to Bermuda, 
It wasn't easy because Wolfhound was bigger and heavier than their boat. After days at sea, the crew was running low on fuel and asked a passing freighter to stop and give them some gas. They kept pulling Wolfhound until the tow line got wrapped around the rudder and they realized they could get stranded in the Bermuda Triangle. So they had to abandon the ship. What really happened and how Wolfhound ended up in the middle of the ocean will probably remain a mystery. Rumor has it that it belonged to a member of the Royal Irish Yacht Club. The ship was going on its first voyage from Connecticut to Bermuda and then Antigua. It got in a terrible storm around 400 miles away from Delaware. The winds were so strong that the yacht suffered two knockdowns. A Greek cargo ship rescued the crew. They left the ship with an emergency beacon on. The rescued crew members shared that they saw the ship sink, which only adds more questions to the story. How did it get back to the surface? Does the Bermuda Triangle have anything to do with that? Christopher Columbus himself reported some unusual compass activity going on in this mysterious area while he was on his way to the New World. Despite the stories of more than 50 ships and 20 planes disappearing in the area, it remains one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the Bermuda Triangle mystery. It could make sense because the busier the area, the more accidents happen there. But then again, it's not the number of disappearances that makes the place so mysterious. It's the lack of explanation and wreckage lost for good. The first ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle was the USS Pickering. In 1800, it departed from the US on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew. No one ever heard anything from them ever since. The popular explanation is that the ship was taken out by a storm. But because no one found any wreckage, we'll never know for sure. The largest ship that has ever disappeared in this mysterious area was the USS Cyclops. In March 1918, carrying a crew of 306 people, the USS Cyclops left Barbados and headed home to Baltimore. The ship passed through the Bermuda Triangle on its journey and vanished into thin air, or rather, water. The Cyclops never sent any distress signal and disappeared without any explanation or trace. The Bermuda Triangle isn't the only place in the world where ships go missing or mysteriously resurface. One of the most famous ghost ship stories would be of SS Bechimo. The large cargo steamer was built in Sweden. On October 1st, 1931, it got caught in pack ice. The crew decided to wait it out and managed to break free after a couple of days, only to get trapped again in less than a week. This time, they didn't manage to make it out. A rescue team went by air to save 22 of the crew members. 15 other members stayed in a wooden shelter they built not far away from the ship. Their plan was to wait out the winter and get back aboard. At the end of November, a strong blizzard was rushing through the area. When it was over, Beichimo seemed to have gone away with the storm. The captain decided it must have broken and sunk. But a few days later, a local hunter informed them that he had seen the ship around 45 miles away from their camp. The crew managed to find the ship and took the most valuable cargo from its hold. They had fears that Bechimo wouldn't live through that rough water, but it did manage to survive after all. Once the ice was gone, it floated away and ended up drifting along the shores of Canada and Alaska. Many people reported seeing the ghost ship in an open sea. Some even tried to board it to save the ship, but the weather didn't allow it to happen. The last time someone saw SS Bechimo was in 1969, 38 years after its crew had left it. It could still be drifting somewhere in the ocean. The story of MV Hoyita 
happened in the South Pacific. The ship was originally a wooden luxury yacht. After serving for 20 years to various owners, it became a merchant ship. In 1959, it set on a trading voyage that was supposed to last around two days. When it didn't reach its destination on time, no one was worried at first as things happen in the open waters. After another day and no distress signals from the Hoyita, it was obvious that something serious was going on with it. There were 25 people aboard and their families wanted to find them. A search and rescue crew worked for six days looking for the ship or at least its wreckage in an area of nearly 100,000 square miles. That's one and a half times as big as Florida. Sadly, the mission had come back with no results. It seemed like Hoyita had disappeared without a trace. A month later, another merchant ship noticed Hoyita driving in the ocean, miles and miles away from its original route, and none of the crew members or passengers were on board. The cargo had also disappeared. The lifeboats were also gone, so the people must have escaped the ship hoping to save themselves. It turned out that the crew had been trying to get help as they tuned the radio to the International Distress Channel. But the damaged cable didn't let them send the signal any further than two miles. It also looked like when they were leaving the ship, the crew took the logbook with them, and we still don't know what exactly happened to Hoyita. Family members of those who were on board are still looking for answers. One professor claims it must have been a corroded pipe that leaked and flooded the vessel. But we'll most likely never know for sure. In the Pacific Ocean, near Japan, there is an area nicknamed the Devil's Sea. It's believed to be one of the 12 vile vortices around the Earth. Some people claim that vile vortices have weird things going on in them because the pull of the planet's electromagnetic waves is stronger there than anywhere else. The most famous ship that disappeared in the area was a fishery patrol vessel in 1952. The ship went there to investigate the vessels that went missing previously and disappeared along with 31 crew members. Scientists who don't believe it was a mysterious disappearance blame the underwater volcano eruption for what happened.